Well, hey, and welcome to the Sexy Aging Podcast. I've got a little backstory to share with the listeners here. This is actually the second time that I have interviewed Penny Ashton. <laughs> Extraordinaire, and I'm going to let her share everything about everything that she does here in New Zealand. This is being recorded in New Zealand, and the reason that we're doing take two is because I had a technical hitch with Zoom. I lost a few recordings through the Christmas break, and Zoom's contacting me, and it's going back and forth, and they can't find the amazing, incredible interview that we had, Penny. And so, A, I was pissed off about that, but B, I get to talk to you again. <laughs> Win-win, and I get to have some product placement in the background because I'm back at my house now. I, I was doing Olive Copper Bottom in Wellington when we talked, and that was, God, that, yeah, that was a while ago now. Yeah, it was this just before is, Christmas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This year is gathering pace already. It is, isn't it? So how about we go straight to that place of what are you doing, who are you, and share your story. And your story is actually the topic of today, which is talking about how women in midlife feel about their changing bodies, I love your story and it's just perfect to share. So how about you start from, you know, what is it that you're doing in New Zealand? You're you're a bit of an icon in the theatre space. I can't wait to see you in person and I am, you know, fangirling, tracking everything you're doing, doing lots of loves on social media. But at some point I'm definitely going to rock up to one of your um, shows or whatever. You've got a lot going on. So share that with us. Uh, yes, so I am uh, New Zealand, uh, born and raised, and I am a, I call myself an entertainer because I do lots of different things, because I have been a self-employed entertainer for 23 years, and the only way to do that is to do lots of different things. So, you know, I started, it was funny, I started doing performance poetry. I always wanted to be a performer, an actor, etc. like I did theatre at university, I applied for drama schools, but I didn't get in. So then I went off to the UK, and I was a temp and a bard maid, you know, and then I came back to New Zealand. I got into a, a Midsummer Night's Dream that was the Summer Shakespeare in Auckland and just then like this gradual you know clawing of your way up like at first it's really hard you know I'm temping um, like my accountant was like you, you've been doing shows for a while and they don't make any money and it's like because everyone thinks that there's an overnight success thing but it takes a long time so first of all I started doing performance poetry because I just wrote a poem one day about being so frustrated that I wasn't performing hilariously and then that led to me doing performance poetry and I've represented New Zealand in poetry slams in the UK I just got back from WOMAD where I run a poetry slam and I've run ones in the Auckland Writers Festival and things poetry can be a little harder to sell than some other things so then my next solo show was about the history of the sex industry which strangely sells a little better uh, and that was called <laughs> Hot Pink Bits and it was about prostitution and pornography and stuff and then I did a very predictable pivot at that point into Jane Austen <laughs> uh yeah <laughs> yeah exactly of course porn Jane Austen makes perfect sense but I'm also an improviser so I did theater sports all the way through school and that and I had done some improv Jane Austen and so we did a, a show called Austen Found the undiscovered musicals of Jane Austen and then that sold really well but there were a lot of us in it and I was like I want all of the money for myself so I wrote a because I was producing everything and then you go that's not enough uh so I wrote a solo show uh called Promise and Promiscuity mm -hmm. and that is 10 years old now and I've been touring that one and then I've written Olive Copperbottom which is a Dickensian show and I'm just writing the Tempestuous which is a Shakespeare show and along the way I do voiceovers like I'm voice um on Power Rangers I do different monsters I shrink you to my perfume bottle ah, 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 and all this sort of <laughs> stuff which is bloody marvelous I wish we had more of that and I do yeah. background vocals in Power Rangers and Spartacus and things I'm a wedding celebrant now so I've been doing that for about 10 years as well and um, I think that's about, oh, and of course, and of course, the way that we are connected is that during lockdown, I was like, oh my God, what the fuck am I doing when they're by light now? I'm like, I'm stuck inside. I didn't do a show for 11 months, which is like the longest practically from when I was zero to four that I hadn't done a show. And so I had been toying with an idea of doing a menopause podcast. I'd pitched it to Radio New Zealand and the spinoff had been turned down. And I was like, well, what else am I doing? I did an online podcasting course for about three hours with for the fantastic Neil Thornton in Wellington. Yep. And um, yeah, bought my Zoom and my microphones. And I've done 63 episodes now of showy ovaries. Um, as it was called, because I once got an ultrasound and the doctor said I had very showy ovaries, which felt appropriate. I don't know what it means, but the jazz handing in there. Um, and yeah, and so, and then here we all are. So that's what I'm, yeah, I've got improv shows coming up. I've got my new show premiering. I'm doing Promise and Promiscuity is touring the country at the moment because of its 10th 
anniversary and a live podcast record, at, which I've been doing a little bit in the Comedy Festival with Justine Smith. That's coming up in May. And um, yeah, and, yeah, and it was this is one of my props for the Tempest. <laughs> <laughs> and for anyone that's not watching the video, that is a rubber chicken. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a buzzard, actually. Oh, oh, so sorry about that. <laughs> it's a buzzard, yeah, and yeah. the idea is when they say test your buzzards, um, they oh. go, yeah, that's what I that got is. that. <laughs> good, good, well done. You yeah, can come. You. I'm going to come. Um, how did you get into theatre? Like, it's, it, it pervades out of you, so if anybody is listening, please get across to the YouTube channel, check out Penny for the energy and obvious passion that you are you know you're living and breathing it every day and that's it's one of the things I love about midlife women who have found the thing that they just need to be doing every day and so but how did you get into it like have you always been in theater where did you start like yeah the beginning. I mean it's not just a midlife thing for me you know the thing with midlife when you come to it is that giving less fucks. I'm also a lot sweary. So when I give less yeah. fucks about giving, saying giving less fucks. So you, and also that imposter syndrome that is just sits there. Like when I first heard the words imposter syndrome, that was like a light switching, right? Just going, oh, it's not just me. Yeah. You know, just the fact that, you know, I'd be at a festival overseas in Edinburgh, like in 2004 and five, I was over there feeling like, oh, should I really be here? You know, getting great reviews, not many people coming because it was poetry uh, and all this. And you just like, well, you know, yeah, so to be able to slough that off and actually just come to a point where I go, I am actually good at this. Yeah. And actually, there's not that many people that can do all of the things that I can do, which then, of course, you have to mitigate being arrogant and tall poppy and things like that. But, no, you know, I just... love it. I love it. Shout other... it out. Yeah. I am right here with you. Right. I do not subscribe to the tall poppy syndrome. You know, I spent 20 years overseas. I got that out of my system. I came back. It's obviously still here. Yeah. But I'm like, deflect, deflect, deflect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm the other with you. thing, yeah, but the other thing I do also think that I file is blown out of all proportion is that talent is luck. You know, you were just born being able to sing. <laughs> yes, you have to work at it, absolutely. And if you're a top of your game, but if someone can't sing and someone can sing, then suddenly they're revered. You know, and, and yeah. it's just pure luck. It's like privilege where you're born into and all that sort of stuff. So I've been very lucky in my life to have very supportive parents, which means that it's given me to know that I can go overseas and if all the shit hit the fan and no one came and I lost all my money, which thankfully hasn't happened. But if it did, to know that you have that backstop makes yeah. an enormous difference in the arts. It really does. So, you know, I'm very lucky that way. Um, I don't really get much CNZ funding at all, and I'm sort of fine with that. They've started to take away the funding to the people that put my shows on. Like, I don't get funding to put on uh, to bring up a show, which a lot of people do, because I never get it, and I'm like, I'm actually in the fortunate position where I don't really need that, but I still need the vehicles to actually perform the shows that I have gotten up, so that's another conversation. But, yes, yeah, so I have always, like, I just did this show in Christchurch, and my mother, because my mother has been on the Court Theatre Supporters Committee for 30-something years. Yeah. So that's the other thing <clears> as well, to have a mother who's so actively involved in theatre and loves going to theatre. Can you, you can be what you can see, right? And I went to the Court Theatre from a really young age. And mum said, she wrote this introduction, excuse me, <laughs> wrote this introduction for the Court Supporters newsletter that was like, we knew we were in for a good time when she was always putting on shows. You know, I think I was like at three or four, I was like putting on shows and all this sort of stuff. And I started ballet when I was four. So I ballet when I was four and I, and I think I got like my first laugh when I was um, eating like a polystyrene cheese. I can still remember the smell of it, but it, like as a mouse and I had to go through a mouse hole and I knocked it over, uh, which I believe caused much merriment and mirth. And I was like, oh, I like that noise. And yeah. And then whenever I did dance, I did dancing for 12 years and I, um, was always the comedy roles you know I was always the frog not the swan uh and stuff like that Jeremy Fisher frog and I just enjoyed like making people laugh and so then I got to high school and I started doing theater sports at school and I also started doing I was in drama I did drama and got to university and did drama so yeah I knew from a young age I wanted to be an actor and then I auditioned for drama school as I said I went to London spent three years not doing any performance and went to Little Mad um I was a waitress yeah. which is in itself a little bit of a performance mm. and um ended up as a receptionist for the conservative party hilarious hilarious <laughs> could not be more opposite to my politics I was less political then but I was like and it was a temp job the guy said to me so why do you want 
what did he say? What do you know about the Conservative Party? That's right. It was like an interview, which you never have for temp jobs, but they'd had a terrible temp before me. And they said, what do you know about the Conservative Party? And it was 98 or something. And I went, you lost. <laughs> <laughs> and you got he the was, job. Yeah, yeah. He was like, we did very well at a local government level. I went, I don't know, Tony Blair's in, you lost. That's all I know. And so they liked my um, organisational skills and chutzpah, I believe. And because I was talking to Lords. I didn't give a shit, right? I'm from New Zealand. I don't give a fuck who you are or what this is in front of your name. I'm not going to give you any more deference than anybody else. So um, that was quite... And I, I once made a joke that William Hague had tried to get in touch with the leader of the local conservative group and he rang him. <laughs> and he was like, did you ring me? And he went, no. Because <laughs> I'd made a joke. So that's funny. Uh, anyway, and then I got back to New Zealand and got into this Midsummer Night's Dream which was great. A lot of people auditioned and not many people got in, but then I didn't get a part that I wanted. And then I just was trying to get parts and I couldn't. And then that's when I started getting put, put up for parts of the fat girl and stuff like that. Cause I was a bit heavier then indeed. And so it was like, this, this part is for someone to do gymnastics on a beam and the ad is for reinforced wood. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's funny, but yeah. it's fucked. Like what man yeah. wrote that, you know? And then the yes. other one was um, a boring dancing nurse that this particular doctor, who was also my flatmate at the time, he didn't want to dance with this nurse because she was too fat. That was the storyline. Okay. And, and I didn't get that part. But then the woman that got that part, I was like, I'm fatter than her. <laughs> <laughs> I should have had that. And then in about 2005, so I got back to New Zealand in 98. And I had an agent and I was trying, you know, and I was doing my shows. By this point, I'd started doing comedy, which is the best vehicle to being self-sufficient in the arts is to write your own material. Mm -hmm. If you're lucky enough to be able to do that, because I've also realized that not everyone can do that. So I'm lucky to be able to have that talent to write an interesting story. Um, but 2005, I was like, I went to, I was dieting, like nobody's business, constantly dieting. I've been dieting since I was, I went on Jenny Craig when I was 18 and I was on Jenny Craig for six months and I managed to lose four kilos in six months, which was soul destroying, you know, like, and they were always like, only eat when you're hungry. And I'm like, I'm always fucking hungry. I only ate when I was hungry. I was watching Oprah and Oprah's like, when you're overweight, there's something deep inside that's holding you back. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I've been very fortunate again, very lucky not to have had any, I went to a Catholic school, but there was no nefarious interferences, uh, you know, cause you're like, what what is it like yeah I've got some insight but you know I'm quite confident I just don't I'm just you know I'm just hungry I only eat when I'm hungry and I'm 77 kilos so it wasn't you know like enormous but it was just enough to not be considered for any roles of you know apart from the character fat girl sort of roles mm -hmm. and um and then I went to a weight loss specialist after I tried Jenny Craig again and it didn't and it budged for a little bit but then not at all and she said I had to eat less feta and olive oil Oh, when, and here we go, full circle. Now we're eating it, and that's the recommended diet for the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean and I wasn't even diet, that, yeah. wasn't even that much of it. And I just mm. was like, "This is fucked. This can't be it." And then just one day, because when I was sixteen, I had an epileptic seizure in school assembly. Good place to have your first seizure. Well uh, done, Penny. Yes, that's that's yes. quite the show. <laughs> yes, and yeah. Happily, my school didn't have any bitches in my year. Anyway, there were no mm. bitches in my school, which I think is unusual. Um, mm. So nobody gave me shit about it. Everyone was very sympathetic. But I, um, and so I started taking these pills called Tegretol Retard, which is also a lovely name for a pill to give to a 16 year old. Here's your Tegretol Retard. It just means slow release, but you're like, well, this is nice. Anyway, and so then, and then I was putting on weight all through this time. And I was like, oh, it's because I'm 16. It's because I'm 17. I went to Germany on exchange for a few months. And it's like, oh, I was eating the food and now I've put on weight and I just can't seem to budget for ages. And then I, one day, just 2005, so that was 1990, so it was like 16 years after that I finally changed it, but I googled Tegretol weight gain and all this stuff came up, and I was like, what the fuck, why has no doctor, no weight loss, no Jenny Craig, nobody has ever asked me about this? So what this medication what you were on, yeah. Exactly. And so the medication mm. I was on promoted me being hungry. So that's why I was hungry all the time. That's why when my mother was saying, have a piece of fruit, which is the most annoying thing to say to somebody <laughs> who's starving, you know, it's not going to touch that. A mandarin is not going to help with the cravings that I have in my pits right now. And it was <laughs> like that. You get to like three o'clock and you're like, ah, I just need something, you know? Yeah. And I was, I remember when I was doing Europe and stuff and you're tripping around and like, you're like, okay, I, 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 I fuck it. I'll have a gelato. That's 
<laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, have, yeah. Have the gelati, have the pizza, have yeah. the experience, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> so when I first did Europe, I was 22 and I was doing it on 20 pounds a day. Oh, yeah, including you could. Including accommodation. <laughs> yeah. So I um, didn't eat much. <laughs> I had a lot of bread and cheese, but I saw a lot of pictures and monuments and things. But yeah. anyway, so then I booked in to see a neurologist and it took nine months to see a neurologist. I'd been contemplating liposuction and stuff because... Then I went to see him anyway, and, and he was like, oh, yeah, we can totally change you to this medication, Lamotrigine, which is much less likely to do that. And so I went on to that. I couldn't drive for six months, which is a big deal. Mm. Again, I'm lucky. I've got so much wrong with me. I've got like five chronic conditions, but none of them wildly inhibit my life. Like I know like a friend of mine's just got post-COVID epilepsy. Horrendous. Oh, no. So she had COVID and now she has epilepsy. Yeah, she's like 44. She's never had a seizure in oh, her life. Yeah. And now she's on giant amounts of, um, I can't remember the name, it's temazepam or something like that, like a thousand milligrams twice a day. And I'm on a hundred milligrams twice a day. So I haven't had a seizure since night. I've only had three big seizures in my life, but I've been on the medication ever since. And I've just been deeply fortunate. And then the change, it was fine. Um, but then Pharmac tried to do a generic Lamotrigine. So that was another fight about uh, medication and stuff with Pharmac. But anyway, so I changed and I and I lost weight. Not a huge amount. Like, you know, I'm generally 71, 72. It was just enough for me to, when I was 16, I went to get jeans from Pants for Pants, the very originally titled <laughs> place in Christchurch. And I was trying on, I think it was the 16, I guess, or maybe it had been the 14 at that point. And I said, oh, can I get the next size up? And they said, they don't make them. Oh. Yeah. And when yeah, you're at 16. That age, yeah. That shit gets in too. It gets in yeah. deep. Um, but Penny, yeah. can I just ask a question? So at 16 and having had this experience with epilepsy and then the medication that causes the weight gain, was that the first time that you'd actually thought about your body shape or weight or was there anything before that? No, there was some before that because, because I do Because, you think... know, as a dancer, and I think that we share this, um, there was quite a focus on the way oh, you absolutely. presented yourself and there were parts that you can do about that and there are things oh, that you can't. I'll do that. That was the main issue. Oh, is that your boobs? That's my boobs. <laughs> That's my boobs. So like they're yeah. like I look she like She has a wall clothes of... on, by the way. Yeah, yeah. But I do look <laughs> yeah. like a wall of tit sometimes walking towards you. Uh, <laughs> yes, I got, yeah, when so then I got, I was a D cup by 12, age 12. Okay, yeah. That's challenging. Yeah. Especially for ballet, you know, like that sort of stuff. It was just like, um, yeah, jumping up and down. Thanks yeah, and my demonstration. Teacher, yeah, and my ballet teacher would say things to me like, "Oh, you have such a wonderful expression. If only I could give you a different body." Okay, well, that's gonna get in, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, mm. So she did not help at all. I had another teacher who was much better who was much more um, promoting of the comedy and the character stuff that I did. And then in fifth form, I was in guys and dolls at school. So this was before I took the meds. So yeah, it was definitely starting before that as well. But because the, the thing is, that was when I was still doing that 80s diet that my parents, you know, like the chips and and all that sort of stuff. But we didn't know that much about healthy eating. This is 89. Yeah, you know, It was only really sort of starting then. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, like, so then when I started dieting, you know, there was a bit of success because I was mitigating the eating patterns that I used to have, but then I just couldn't get past any sort of point but I've got some diary entries oh my god they're, they're just tragic like one says and I, and I know this is going to maybe offend some people because it's a little insensitive but it says um this girl at school um the fifth form anorexic went back to hospital today I don't understand her she's beyond my comprehension but at least she's not fat like me well so, okay uh, well that that's really confronting because that actually sums up teenage angst around body shape and I don't think it's changed that much yeah but, I don't I yeah. don't have children but I have talked yeah. to some young women and it doesn't feel like it's changed that much at all which is and you know the 2000s were terrible the yeah. early 2000s were like you know there was the ladette culture you could do whatever you want but Paris Hilton skinny mm. Paris Hilton's boyfriend leaks their sex tape nothing to do with her and then the world turns on her and calls her a slut yeah. You know, Monica yeah. Lewinsky was the slut, despite being a very young woman completely taken advantage of by a man with so much more power. You have Weinstein going around. You have like the wonderful Pamela Anderson documentary that was just on Netflix. Oh, uh, brilliant. I loved yes. it. Yeah. Where her sex tape was stolen and disseminated. Sorry to use that word. But and then she is the one again that is called a slut. And it just 
and I had quite a lot of slut shaming during in the comedy industry in the early 2000s as well you know mm. because it was a bit of a slut and who cares Woohoo! And, and I think that actually comes back to the fact that I was a bit skinnier and finally people were looking at me and taking interest like university I was yeah shagging all over the place because I could because people wanted to and I didn't really you know and I also don't have any sort of hang-ups about casual sex I look at it like coffee I prefer real coffee but if there's instant around I'll take it and <laughs> not be too <laughs> complaining about it that was that was back then just reiterating <laughs> well I mean Maybe. fuck it even if I wasn't married now I think yeah. I would be still feeling like that but I do like being married and um That's good. having infrequent sex with my husband <laughs> topic hey yeah. I just want to jump on that 2000s thing because I think that say so the audience has probably been with me for a couple of years now through the podcast and I don't think I've really spoken about my my personal experience with body dysmorphia I think probably people see me as this fitness person that kind of knows exactly what she's doing I dish out a lot of advice you know it's like it comes from a place of you know science and it's yeah. no, no bs right but and knowledge knowledge yeah, you have knowledge yeah, i've spent yeah. time yeah and make you're sure you're in the I'm, industry i'm in the industry yeah so while i was in the industry in the 2000s i spent a decade competing in miss fitness and bodybuilding style shows that rely on you having low body fat lean muscle tissue striation six pack and it became a thing where I, when I wasn't competing, it felt like people didn't pay any attention to me. And when I was competing, the compliments would be flowing. And, oh, my God, you look amazing, blah, blah, blah. And when you get up on stage and you get all the accolades and then you get the trips overseas and all the sponsorship that comes with it. So all that affirmation around how my body had to look to get recognized or you know, feel good about myself went on for about 10 years. And a big part of that is the diet, right? So the diet means that you're an extreme calorie restriction, particularly with carbohydrates. So there'll be a couple of weeks leading up to a show where you literally can't remember your address or your name. And you're just trying you're to get, so you're, so, you're, you're so depleted. I don't, I don't remember being hungry because it just got to a point where you train your body to only take on X amount of fuel and you spend that time with that fuel training. The rest of the time is like trying to get through the personal training session for somebody else, you know? So I did this for 10 years. When I think back on that, I like, I look at all the amazing things that I got out of it. Discipline, understanding of my body, helping other people lose weight, getting overseas trips, um, having this kind of title around being an expert in this space. Like there's a lot of really cool stuff. But it lasted with me for five years after I stopped where I couldn't literally get through a meal without counting the calories. Yeah, wow. So yeah. Th that's actually that for me, when I look back on it now, I think, wow, I wasted a lot of time, mm. you know? And, yeah. and I Nikki, think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and also it's really bad for your heart, right? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, the I mean, at least I was quite young and I don't think that I have... You know, I think I've probably been able to make up for it now, especially right. full focus on future health. Like I always think about what does my future look like now? Yeah. Heart yeah. health, bone health, you know, my bucket list is massive and I need to be really healthy and I try to help people understand that. But I think it is challenging when you see a, a person that probably doesn't have any major weight challenges trying to tell you, hey, it's a mindset shift. So I do really empathize with people that are struggling Mm. you know with weight mm. gain especially during midlife and like bodybuilding is crazy like that to yeah. me is a dysmorphia as well right like to 100%. the whole other level where yeah you look like a, a chiseled uh sculpture but yeah, yeah I mean like and that's the thing too is like for me you know I was dieting like a motherfucker I was going to the gym six days a week I was doing body attack uh, former, uh, also Les Mills, even though I haven't been to Les Mills for a year and a half because of COVID, I've just still got my membership because I'm on a check because I've been a member, well, since 98, but I was actually a member from 92 for a few years as well. You're so a I lifetime was, member. I am. Well, I wish I bought one of those. They were selling those. It was yes. $1,500. Imagine. Yeah, but I don't think that they've honored it. Uh, anyway, we won't. Oh, have they not? Yeah. Oh, that's a whole other, that's a whole other conversation. Uh, uh, anyway. Yeah. yeah, right. Okay. Um, yeah, because it was very cheap, but it wasn't yeah. in 1992. No. But anyway. Um, uh, yeah, like, and, but for me to get, I just could never get to that without utterly starving myself. And it's just the dehydration and stuff as well from that too. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, cause you don't drink water for two days beforehand or something, do you? 
Yeah, it's like minimal sips of water to really tighten the skin. And then exactly, you because influx, it's shrinking. Yeah, then you influx the carbs to push the muscle out even further against the skin. So it's a real science. That's, yeah. I mean, that's one of the things I kind of enjoyed about it, the science and the tweaking. But then it's like so, it's all you think about. It's so uh, self-absorbed. <laughs> yeah, that's what I like Nikki Pellegrino's book, and she said it in my podcast as well, that you, she could have powered a small nation with the amount of effort she put into weight loss yeah. and, and thinking about it. And see, this is what happened to me just recently, just out of nowhere. So I put on this dress that I usually wear, and I was like, what the fuck is this spare tire happening around the middle? And that had never happened to me before. Hmm. And because I've been like, because I'm 49, right? And I'm like, is it, you know, is it, especially with is menopause. It? Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. like, because, you know, I'm a bit hot at the moment, but I'm wearing some synthetic fibers and I had a coffee. So I'm like, no, I don't think this is a hot flush because no. I've heard what they are and it's not this. But um, but because I'm not really, I just perimenopausal with my periods. Basically, that's the only thing that's happening. But I'm like the whole time going, is this, is this, is this? <laughs> and anyway, so then all this weight came and I got really depressed for a couple of days, just going over a bit longer than that, just going, fuck. See, this is the thing that's terrified me because I've been so focused on it, like, for my earlier years funny on my podcast a lot of people like Jackie Clark is like oh you know we used to look back and think we were so beautiful and I was like nah nah no. that's not my yeah. experience it's the other way around so yeah. I really came into myself and how I felt in my late 20s early 30s to being comfortable with myself I mean I was 31 when I changed that medication um but I've been like 72 kilos solid for the last nearly 20 years you know like I've hardly moved which has been a good and it's it didn't good. matter how it's much healthy yeah it didn't matter how much I dieted or how much I didn't that nothing changed and then all of a sudden I went and it was 74 kilos and I was like the thought of having to go back into the mindset of like I didn't eat cheese for 10 years cheese is great oh, and I didn't eat cheese awesome <laughs> I know particularly cheddar tasty cheddar cheese yeah. I didn't eat that for a decade like my friend said she had a dream once and we were going out and they had cake but she said but you didn't have any in and, dream, and the dream oh. in her dream and then my other flatmate I was talking about you know like being obsessed with weight loss and she went yeah all those salads and yeah. so she summed up her flatting experience with me was all of those salads oh. so and now my husband doesn't like salad for a main meal which drives me crazy um but we that's so, so the thought of having to go back into being so obsessed like that but then what I started doing was I started having smoothies for lunch um protein smoothies and stuff which you know I tasty and I started doing because I haven't been going to the gym I usually do spin classes but mm. so I was going for these runs but like run walks because I don't yeah. really and I was trying to do it really minimal impact because I often pull muscles yeah I think that could be to do with old, or getting older but also this blood sort of situation that I have going on and and then I pulled a fucking calf muscle but I managed to lose the two kilos yeah which I've you never changed really things up a bit do. You changed okay. it up. You just changed yeah. it up a bit. You in increased your protein levels a little bit more to, so that you were full from yeah. that meal, your protein yeah. shake. And then, yeah. yeah, you just increased your activity to something that you weren't doing before. So yeah. just changing it up. It's good. Yeah. And I do, and I have, oh, where are they? They're not here. You got some weights. My weights. Yeah. yeah. They must awesome. be in somewhere else. They're in the, the lounge room because I watch television doing my four kilo weights. And actually yeah. I'm probably more buff here than I have been for ages because you know often I'll just do a spin class and then some yeah. weights but I've been doing and also four kilo weights are quite heavy yeah. for biceps and triceps and all that sort of stuff so I've been yeah. enjoying doing that watching the Great British Sewing Bee uh, <laughs> and some other things like that I'm like oh look at those zigzag edges you know <laughs> <laughs> multitasking at its finest looking yeah, after your exactly. health and learning something at the same time I love yeah. it yeah, yeah, because yeah. I am very healthy generally with how I eat and stuff because it's byproducts of being so obsessed for so long. But, you yeah. know, I'm like, I will have a date scone, bugger it, you know, and I will, but I always have a scone rather than a cake because it has less sugar in it, you know, yeah. and just stuff like that. But I like yeah. scones. Yeah, I like scones. Hey, yeah. um, so I was just telling you before we got interviewing, before I pushed you know, record yep. um, about the Gwyneth Paltrow video that came out last week that went viral. Um, and, you know, you mentioned you hadn't seen it and that's not a bad thing. So, um, and it really got me thinking a lot. I was thinking about it a lot last week and I was really looking forward to catching up with you to talk about sort of body dysmorphia in midlife. And I do feel that we are so conditioned as generation X woman that to be on some kind of diet and 
when we hit perimenopause and you know you've just highlighted that you've noticed a little change yourself the the belly around you know the extra yep. layer around your belly yep it's so common like yep. four out of five women will experience this type of weight gain it is due to insulin resistance because estrogen levels are dropping so once you understand that from a physiological perspective i think there's a level of kindness we can bring to ourselves yeah. you know um but it's hard though right like when oh, like for me super hard but it's yeah. also super hard that i was doing that for so long and then have reached a stasis of being reasonably happy for 20 years and then you know for, i think for a lot of people that yes they've all been dieting and stuff but all those people were skinny as youths you know and then suddenly what having kids and stuff and things changed that but for me mm. i was so unhappy like my diary is like like there's that one but the other one is like I can't believe I'm epileptic when I had my seizure. First, I'm fat. Second, not particularly attractive. And now this. Like, that was Look what at was... you now. Far Thank you. Out. You're a stunner. Thank you very much. But yeah, <laughs> it was like... Come into your own in midlife. <laughs> yeah, 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 right? yeah. You know, I get yeah. Botox. I get Botox now, like, because I hated the bags under my eyes that were forming when I smiled. So, um, you know, so it's, it's this... It's this weird feminist, um, you know, you want to say, fuck it, and I'm not going to blah, 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 and who cares if I've got wrinkles, I'll be like Frances McDormand, but, you know, like, but then you just deep level feel that you want to do something to for yourself too. It's not, yourself, it's not about yeah. the male gaze for me. Yeah. It's about the female gaze in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, it's when you wake up in the mirror and you can see it for yourself. Yeah, like I completely understand. It's like it. when you look down when you're taking a <laughs> selfie, it's the most horrifying. You're like, I am 93 years old. And then you look up into the sun and go like this and like, yeah. Years yeah. old. So it's all about the camera angle, basically. It's Absolutely. How Absolutely. close I am to the light that I have just here. So, yeah. So, getting back to the Gwyneth video, so I'll frame that so that um everyone can understand that i'm not keeping something secret from them <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, um gwyneth was being interviewed by her doctor and i just want to clarify that her doctor was not a medical doctor it was a um, health coach holistic naturopath style doctor and while they do have training for that role it's not medical training can they use the word doctor actually yeah, because anyone that's had a PhD can use oh, the word doctor. It's PhD, right? Yeah. Okay. So PhD, just be yeah. aware of that. <laughs> yeah, but then you know, a PhD is something. So yeah, it is right. something, and yeah. it's actually on my bucket list. So I, I have all these things that I want to study, um, and this is actually one of the topics I want to do, which is body dysmorphia midlife. Like I want to really go there with the topic and find out where people are at, where they think. Anyway, that's another thing, bucket list thing. Back to Gwyneth, <laughs> round three. <laughs> Um, so she's being interviewed by him on a podcast. She's sitting there. She has an IV in her arm because she's having IV um, vitamins and minerals. And she's explaining her day. And her day means that she does a nice little intimate fast. That's what she describes it as, which we find out is about 18 hours long, which is pretty long for a fast. It's not intermittent either. That's mo mainly fasting. That's mostly fasting. Yeah. Is that every day? Every, every day. day. Yeah. yeah, that's not intermittent. That's no. just depriving that's yourself of substance. Not eating. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. she's got the IV, so <laughs> we're good. Um, and then she says she only has a coffee in the morning because it helps with regulate her blood sugar. Not sure about that. And then the first thing meal of the day is a bone broth soup. And I, that's where I was absolutely floored. And then her evening meal, she says, I mostly eat keto, but I just eat a heap of vegetables. So when I kind of added up the calories, we were looking at like not more than 800 calories a day and you need 2000 don't you isn't that the a thing? minimum 2000 and you know it just obviously depends on your energy levels it depends on your current weight situation it depends on any health implications that you have so everybody is different but baseline minimum 2000 for nutrient dense quality for your body you know for your what body a protein to be where's the protein where's you know? the protein yeah yeah so anyway, it went crazy and I just felt like that is absolutely feeding into that diet mentality that we're trying to move away from, help midlife women reset the mind that menopause is a pause. It's a moment where you get to go, you know what, 
that stuff's not working for me anymore. I've got the rest of my life to look forward to. What do I need to do right now and what changes should I be making that's going to have lasting implications on my health? And I know that they're not instant fixes, that this is just a step-by-step -step foundation building of my bones and my muscles and my heart health and my mental clarity and all these little things that I'm going to do now on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, I'm not going to see an instant two kilogram weight loss in one week, but I'm going to live longer. I'm going to get to see my family, you know, have their dreams discovered. So yeah, like she's not yeah. living longer. She just feels like she is because it's misery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but she's a billionaire. She can do what she likes. That's well, that's it. She can afford to get IV, you know, vitamins, which is yeah. just, I mean, the whole, I'm this whole bill that's trying to go through the parliament in New Zealand at the moment, which is a regulation of the vitamin and natural industries, which I think is really good and needs to be regulated. There's so much completely spurious claims. It's like this post-truth world, like Trump can make all this bullshit up and so can people going scientifically proven. Whereas, yeah. you know, vitamins, there's fuck all proof around vitamins at all. It's just expensive piss, basically, excuse me. You know, mm. it just it just blows my mind. And I know that some people, like my husband, um, he, he complains we don't don't eat enough red meat I'm back I'm we're avoiding colorectal cancer and we're helping the planet so you can take some vitamin b12 supplements because we don't eat enough red meat you know like so that yes that is something that makes sense because he needs it but just for general like multivitamins and all those ones for women's I don't know the thing is too the placebo effect is real it's something like 20 percent crazy with the placebo effect but I don't think it will ever work on me because I'm so deeply cynical about <laughs> anything and have yeah. you had this when you start doing a menopause podcast suddenly you get emails from all over the world yeah. from people that will be so good on your podcast to sell oh, yeah. you something oh 100 percent. but that yeah. yeah they're selling me a lifestyle program yeah when i create a lifestyle program <laughs> especially for you you're actually like i'm selling nothing and i'm determined to sell nothing basically apart yeah. from knowledge and women's stories yeah. so um yeah and so i'm like no i'm not gonna like i had two they did sound quite fun ladies but they're running a menopause retreat in Bali and could we talk about that I'm like nah no, okay <laughs> the only way you're going to talk about it is if they fly you there yeah yeah maybe and maybe, that's a yeah. deal <laughs> yeah even then even then yeah. like because I hate yoga I hate all that like it's not <laughs> for me all that staying still and breathing is not yeah. not what I'm into you know like I'm much more about pumping and music yeah. and stuff, so, yeah. hey Penny let's revisit this conversation in about five years <laughs> oh okay okay uh, we'll I see. was like I was like that too. I was like, I couldn't think of anything worse than staying still and stretching my muscles into p poses that had weird names. But, you know. I child found, pose. I do do child pose child at the pose end of doing good. press ups yeah. and things like that. So there's some yeah. child pose there. There's but a yeah. start. There's a start. And take mm. ten, 10 deep breaths for stress reduction. And that's a start, you know. Yeah, it's funny. Like, so. I've never had anxiety at all so that's something that you know like right. is that going to happen you know like because I know that's one of the that's the one that's driven me the most crazy that was never told to people so yeah. that there's been this absolute waste of time of people on antidepressants and feeling stigmatized not that there's anything wrong with having mental health issues obviously yeah. but it's like a complete misdiagnosis around you know like Marion Keys. I don't know if this has happened yet she wrote a book in her late 40s about I've never had depression before and anxiety but suddenly I've got it and then and then just recently I've gone that was probably menopause that she just had no idea about yeah um it's no surprise to me I um this is where I do a little confession so I kick-started a TikTok account um, originally in lockdown with my daughter so that you know we could do some bonding she was being a real shit at that age she was about 15 and so you know I kind of thought oh I'll do TikTok we'll have some fun together and it was a lockdown you know thing to do and it brought a bit of joy I love to dance yeah it was cool when I moved back to New Zealand I didn't really use it I didn't use my TikTok account I was like I don't need to dance here I'm free I have a walk on the beach I'm good um, but I changed it up to talk about menopause stuff and it's suddenly gone, it's overtaken all my other social media accounts, uh, which blew my mind. I've learned a lot about TikTok since I've learned things about Tereo, culture, uh, marketing, ADHD. Like I've learned so much good stuff through TikTok, TikTok, which is, yes, which is very interesting. And now I'm like putting aside my judgment that it's just for younger people. But the thing is, the top comments for one of the posts that I have, which has over 130,000 views, the top comment is, I started at 38, I started at 39, 
I think this is perimenopause and I'm only 40. So that is blowing my mind that I'm getting that much response from much, much younger women saying everything you've described has been me for the last couple of years. Do you think it's perimenopause? And of course, you know, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to say yes or no, because it could be hypothyroidism. It could be anything else. But I'm not, I am going to say now's the time to investigate. Yes. Now's the time to educate yourself, because yeah. if you're already asking the question and you're only 38, 39, then you're going to find out and you're not going to have the psychological damage that I had with anxiety for three years without knowing about it. Exactly. Like, you know? that's, I have been infuriated, like infuriated, <laughs> particularly around medical training. You know, yeah. 51% of the population is guaranteed to go through this and you get one afternoon fucking workshop in med school about menopause when it affects if you know what is it like 80 I don't know how many estrogen receptors we have in our body that that is just the huge <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely you know in our bloody salivary glands just everywhere and the fact that they're not taught about it and that there's still like I had a talking to an older woman um in that they were in that cohort that was completely screwed by the WHI study being misinterpreted yeah. um <clears throat> and her doctor was like she was on HRT she, she didn't get on it but then the doctor was like it's time for you to come off now you've been on it too long to come <laughs> off so um she's Sorry, come off laughing and then, <laughs> yeah and then it, and then it all came back and her doctor's like you can't go on it again now which isn't necessarily true you know yeah. so and you just believe the doctor and of course the doctors you know I can sometimes think the doctors have been a disservice dealt a disservice as well yeah. but I do think that if you even hearing some of this stuff as a GP <clears throat> you should be looking into it as a matter of respect to your woman in your um you know because women have been ignored so long around you know seat belt testing they did yeah. that on men just all this sort of shit particularly the medications people have died because they couldn't they didn't get it right for women because they didn't test them on women because hormones makes it so difficult mm. even though and and this is what I come back to in my podcast I bang on and on and on about it it's the very process that peoples the world it's the only thing that keeps the human race going is our hormone ridden bodies yes we need some sperm um but you know like we we are the ones that make the world so afford us some bloody respect I mean I haven't you've bred I have no interest to do it to do that but uh <laughs> you know it's it is that very symptom and it's been held yeah. up, held us down from People not, you know, we weren't allowed to talk about our periods for a long time. Happily, that's changed, except in America, a.k.a. a totalitarian bullshit state. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> pregnant women had to stay at home. Like, as, you know, as soon as you got married, you had to quit your job in, like, the 60s and stuff. Pregnant women were disgusting and should hide themselves. And now the last taboo is, is menopause. So, But it's the beginning, the middle, and the end of the menstrual cycle that peoples the world, and it's been the very thing that's used as a cudgel to keep women down. And, like, that can go fuck itself yeah. yeah and we might just wrap it up <laughs> with that final <laughs> ranty I'll... ranty rant rant yes and the curtains closed <laughs> there we go. There. no and, uh, i love it i love it yeah. your your energy and your perspective and i think a lot of women will share uh, a lot of your thoughts and you know how how you feel it i mean i'm hearing it every day you're probably hearing it every day these conversations about you know why didn't we know and why isn't more being done and we're just we're that loud generation we will you know go come on let's get shit done let's make a difference and i do think it's that thing you know? that gen x is used to having information at our fingertips and we you know we're not digital natives but we were digital teenagers yeah. uh you know sort of thing so you know we're used to that and then to fun suddenly find that there's this a whole thing that is completely ruined it for us uh yeah what with, with you know not told us not told us it's just yeah. astonishing, astonishing yeah thank you penny um i just want to leave you with is there one last message that you want to share with the audience around maybe your body or accepting your body because you're obviously super comfortable you're a beautiful woman you're highly successful in what you do you bring joy to so many people through your performances um is there any last words that you'd like to give here on sexy aging um yeah i think it's just the sloughing off of the imposter syndrome and the giving less fucks and and also i'm so fucking sick of people saying that women shouldn't swear and I'm going to leave you with a quote because I'm obviously quite sweary as you know you could have made your points without swearing but as somebody in the comedy scene I will tell you that a laugh can be elicited so much more you know with a well-placed if you use it all the time it becomes very tedious but with a well-placed swear word we'll get a laugh when it wouldn't otherwise but the scientific American has said that those who are particularly vulgar may also be particularly eloquent and intelligent yes so, 
So yes, girl. there. So, so there, there is what I say to that. <laughs> <laughs> so good is what I say to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Thank you.